I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Reverend Chase, and I'm sure some of you were looking for Reverend Chase to be standing here this morning. Reverend Chase will be back next Sunday. And I want to thank you for the invitation to serve here at Emmanuel in her absence. Thank you so much. Well, let's get right into our message this morning. Living by faith. Living by faith. That is our subject this morning. To better understand this concept of living by faith, we will take a look at the book of Hebrews chapter 11. This chapter is sometimes referred to as the hall of fame of faith and the hall of heroes. But most often, it is simply referred to as the faith chapter. Chapter 11 was written to appeal to some Hebrews who had come to believe in Jesus Christ, but who were now facing difficulties, tough times, abuse, and even persecution for their choice to follow Jesus. For a while, these Jewish converts had remained confident, but now they are losing hope. Their confidence is waning, and they are thinking about giving up and turning aside from their newfound faith. Many of us today are living with this same sense of hopelessness. And if it is not you, you probably know someone who is. On our jobs, in our homes, and even in our churches, you may hear things like, life is a thing. I can't take it anymore. I give up. I quit. It's not worth it. There is a pervasive, overwhelming sense of despair and seemingly nothing to live for. And some folk have gone to the extreme of killing themselves and killing others. The El Paso, Texas and Dayton, Dayton Ohio shootings are fresh on our minds. In chapter 10 of Hebrews, Beginning in verse 35, the writer tries to encourage the Jewish converts not to give up, not to throw in the towel. Now I want to read that, that and I ask that you listen carefully to what the writer is telling these Jewish converts because it is as relevant for us today as it was for them so many years ago. This is Hebrews chapter 10, and we begin at verse 35. Do not therefore abandon that confidence of yours. It brings a great reward. For you need endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet, in a very little while, the one who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. I want you to hear that one again. But my righteous one will live by faith. My soul takes no pleasure in anyone who shrinks back. But we are not among those who shrink back and so are lost, but among those who have faith and so are saved. This is Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 through 39. Notice that it says in this passage, the righteous will live by faith. The righteous will live by faith. That's the premise upon which a man enters the new covenant. But what's so interesting about this is that it's a quote from Habakkuk. Habakkuk, one of the Old Testament prophets. Even in the Old Testament, the true saints lived by faith. Faith, you see, is foundational to the Christian life. 
the writer wants the struggling converts to hold on to their faith. So he writes chapter 11 to explain to them what faith is and how it works. In the first three verses of chapter 11, the writer describes the character of faith, what it is, the witness of faith, and the design of faith. So let's look first at the character of faith, and that's verse 1. Now, faith is the substance, and I know, I know I'll say, because we read different, we read, we read different translations, and it was a different one read this morning, but listen to this. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, you notice there are two parts to this verse. The first part being, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Other Bible translations replace the word substance with confirmation, assurance, evidence, reality, and even title deed, among others. The Greek word for substance is hypostasis. Stasis. And it means to stand under, support, undergird. Hypostasis also had a legal meaning that signified a foundational document. And that's where we get the title deed a foundational document such as a title deed. In the second part of verse 1, the evidence of things not seen, the word evidence here is the Greek word elenkos, meaning a conviction, a conviction. Therefore, faith is the conviction that the unseen exists, that what is hoped for is real. Let's say that one more time. Therefore, faith is the conviction that the unseen exists, that which is hoped for is real. Now you might be thinking, but things hoped for don't have any substance. They're just hoped for. But let me tell you, it is the faith that makes them real. God is real. In the Bible, hope is not a word of doubt, but of confidence. When we believe what God has promised in his word, we possess the title deed to whatever it is that he has promised. Whether or not we have seen it yet makes no difference. It belongs to us anyway. The Bible says don't believe your senses. Believe in the invisible God who we can only know through faith. If you will remember, one of Jesus' disciples refused to believe that Jesus had risen from the dead until he saw Jesus in the flesh, touched the nail prints in his hand, and put his own hand in the side of Jesus. But the Jewish converts did not have that chance, and neither will we. But that is what faith is, believing in what we cannot see. We walk by faith and not by sight. Now, now we move to the witness of faith. And that's verse 2. Indeed, by faith, our ancestors received approval. Indeed, by faith, our ancestors received approval. Now, we know in verse 1 that God is real and that we have to have faith in God. But now we want to look at our ancestors. What do we mean by that? When you look through chapter 11, you see repeatedly two words, by faith, by faith, by faith. Here the writer lifts up the Old Testament saints as witnesses of those who lived by faith. By faith, Noah. By faith, Noah. Can you imagine building a boat in the middle of the desert? because it was going to rain. Noah didn't even know what rain was, but God said, build a boat, it's gonna rain. So, so, so Noah labored for 120 years, cutting down gopher trees and building a boat. Then one day, now not 
not lying to you, mind you. All the other people thought he was crazy. A boat? You need a boat? Rain? Look how far we are even from water. This was a desert. But one day, God said, gather up your family and gather up the animals two by two. And when Noah got all of them on the boat and got the doors closed, the pitter-patter of the rain, the pitter-patter of the rain started and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Abraham. God told Abraham to go to get up and leave his homeland of Ur, his family, and go to a land that he would show him. For his obedience, God promised Abraham that he would make him a great nation, that he would bless him and make his name great. He would be a blessing, and through him all the families of the earth would be blessed. God is faithful. Yet in the land that God showed Abraham, he and Sarah, his wife, remained tent dwellers for the rest of their lives. And the only land that Abraham owned there was Sarah's tomb. By faith, Moses. By faith, Moses. God told Moses to go down to Egypt land and tell Pharaoh to let his people go. Now, Moses is the one that I identify most with. And you might be asking why. I identify most with Moses because Moses had a bunch of excuses for God. Bunch of excuses for God. Who should I say sent me? And you know how we are when we're making our excuses, we start to whine a little bit. Who should I say sent me? What if they don't believe me? What if they don't want to listen to me? Lord, I don't know how to talk. You can't mean me, Lord. You can't mean me, Lord. But the Lord did mean Moses. And so, finally, Moses musters up the courage and the faith to obey God and lead God's people out of Egypt. Most of chapter 11 is dedicated to the Old Testament witnesses who knew enough about God to trust and obey him even when they were faced with doubts or challenges. The Old Testament witnesses didn't receive the things promised, but only saw them from a distance. They were people of faith, and faith gave substance, that word again, substance, to what was yet in the future. God approves of those who walk by faith, for faith is the key to eternal life. Verse 6 tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. The writer, the writer reaches back and pulls out witnesses from the Old Testament so that we New Testament Christians will know that what worked for them is what will work for us today. The Old Testament witnesses cited in chapter 11 or what is called in chapter 12 of Hebrews, the great cloud of witnesses. Those who were faithful here on earth and are now in glory. And you know what they're doing? They're looking over the banisters of heaven, encouraging us to endure, to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And then we look at verse 3, the design of faith. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. So we've looked at verse 1, the character of faith, verse 2, the witness of faith, and now the design of faith. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God. So that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. Now verse 3 is not always emphasized or highlighted as much as the other two verses, but it is equally, um, equally important in our understanding of faith. 
to make his point to the Jewish converts, the writer takes them all the way, all the way back to the beginning, all the way back to creation itself. The first book of the Bible is Genesis. And Genesis begins with these words. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, and God said, and God said. You see, when God spoke, the world was created. At his command, everything appeared. Yes, I know this is the great debate, whether the worlds were created or whether the world evolved. Those who believe in creation maintain that the intricate design of the universe implies a designer. It implies a designer, and the designer is God. Those who believe in evolution maintain that the universe is a product of random chance and excessive time. The fundamental question in deciding between creation and evolution is who determines truth? Who determines truth, God or man? John MacArthur, a Christian pastor, teacher, and author in Sun Valley, California, says this. It is impossible to make sense of truth without acknowledging God as the necessary starting point. Hear that again. It is impossible to make sense of truth without acknowledging God as the necessary starting point. So when you say who determines truth, God or man, and we answer it this way, it is impossible to make sense of truth without acknowledging God as the necessary starting point. We must stand on the Bible. We stand on the word of God. The God that we do not see, the unseen God, spoke the universe, the worlds into existence. Verse three is simply a restatement of the fact. The writer takes time to remind the Jewish converts of who they are and whose they are. That they are Jews who have always believed in the God who created the worlds by simply speaking them into existence. And that they know this by faith because they could never know this by sight. Faith is, faith is, faith is taking God at his word. You remember the centurion in the Gospel of Luke who wanted Jesus to heal his sick servant. Jesus was miles from the centurion's home where the servant was. But the centurion said to Jesus, he said to Jesus, just say the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus commanded, commanded to the crowd that not even in Israel had he found someone with such great faith. Brothers and sisters in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ, when we accept Christ's death and resurrection, we began a journey of faith, trusting the unseen God for everything that we need. C.S. Lewis, the great Christian writer, saw faith as a submission to common sense, a submission to common sense. C.S. Lewis said, to have faith in Christ means, of course, trying to do all that he says. There would be no sense in saying you trusted a person if you would not take his advice. Thus, if you have really handed yourself over to him, it must follow that you are trying to obey him. But trying in a new way, a less worried way, not doing these things in order to be saved, but because he has begun to save you already. Not hoping to get to heaven as a reward for your actions, but inevitably 
wanting to act in a certain way because a first faint gleam of heaven is already inside you. As the Jewish converts learned, it's a lifestyle, y'all. It's a lifestyle. When we come to faith in Christ, he gives us the Holy Spirit who empowers us to pursue righteousness. He commands us to walk in the spirit. And if we walk in the spirit, we will live a lifestyle of total surrender to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, believing that the future that God promised is for real. And if we believe that God's promise is real, then we will wait patiently for it. We won't get upset. We won't get rattled. We won't get worried. We will just wait for it. You remember it says in Isaiah, the 40th chapter, verse 31, those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not sing. Now, some of you may remember that when I was here in June, I mentioned that I am not a patient person. And I'm working on that. I'm working on that. I'm working on that because, because, because we as children of God must keep the faith. We can't give up. We can't quit. And we cannot faint. We've got to persevere, to endure, to run the race that is set before us, that we might receive God's approval so that one day, one day, we too might be counted among the great cloud of witnesses. That we might be one day counted among the great cloud of witnesses. There is a song that goes, we've come this far by faith, and it says, we've come this far by faith. Leaning on the Lord, trusting in his holy word and he has never failed us yet we've come this far by faith brothers and sisters and we're leaning on the lord we're trusting in his holy word and you know he didn't fail the old saints and he's not going to fail us either this is the word of god for the people of god thanks be to god amen <laughs>